Shalom. This is Danny Palmer. I'm the teacher here, uh, or rabbi, whichever you prefer, in a small group here in Springfield, Missouri, Yechad Kahal. We've been doing these videos for quite some time on a series called The, the Covenant, or The Breed. Uh, we don't know how long these are going to last, because I'm going on his leading. But I know that as we go through the Torah, that many people really don't have a clue what a covenant is. And, as usual, I'm going to touch on a couple things from last week's portion and uh, how they tie into this week. The first one is going to be in Genesis chapter, chapter uh, 19. The sun had risen over the land when Lot reached Soar, that out of the sky Yahweh rained burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and whatever grew on the ground. Now we'll skip down to verse 30. Lot departed from Soar and lived in the mountains along with his two daughters because he was afraid to live in Soar. Instead, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's no man in the land to sleep with us, as is the custom of all the land. Now it's about 24 hours from the time of verse 23 to verse 30. Uh, Soar has not been destroyed, but the other four cities have. They go up into the mountains because Lot no longer feels safe. And his daughters uh, ply him with wine. And the first night, the older daughter sleeps with him. And the second night, the younger daughter sleeps with him. And uh, two sons are conceived uh, named Moab and Ammon. Yet, they left the city of Tsoar seeing living people. So what was behind what Lot's daughters said when they said there was not a man left on the earth to lie with them and the custom of human beings, which is, you know, sexual intercourse to produce offspring. We don't know. The Torah doesn't really delve into that any deeper. So it's just a point to ponder. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, catch these little things, but uh, that's the kind of uh, thinking process that Yahweh gave me. That's why words mean something to me. I need to know context and everything. It's why geography and history matter to me. I want to know the details. If corrections need to be made, I'm not afraid to make them. So. Those of you who struggle with when you find something about your faith that scripture seems to uh, say the exact opposite of what you've been taught, I would suggest that you lay the word scripture. Also in Genesis 22:19 and 23:2, in 19 it says, Abraham went back to his young men, and they got up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham settled in Beersheba. Now this is after Abraham and uh, Yitzchak come back from Mount Moriah. And uh, Abraham does not continue from there. So the last place it says he stops before we get to the next verse I'm going to read. Which is verses 1 and 2 of chapter 23. Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were all the years of the life of Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abram went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. The commentators are in agreement with what I seem to see here that at least up until Sarah died and how long a period this was, uh, Sarah and Abraham apparently were separated. Uh, many of the Jewish commentators especially believe it's because Sarah found out about the Mount Moriah incident. It does make sense. Don't know for sure if that's what it is or not. But we know that there are some issues with Abraham and Sarah, especially during the latter years when the promises are first made to Abraham. Some uh, missteps are made by both of them as to how the promise is going to be fulfilled. Because the promise is about a land. And how Abraham's descendants will inherit a land. Uh, Genesis 24, 62 presents us 
with another interesting thing. It says, now Yitzchak was returning from Be'er Lachai Roi, for he was living in the Negev region. Now this is when the Abraham servant is returning with Rivka. Uh, Yitzchak is out in the field. And it tells us that he's near Be'er Lachai Roi, which is familiar because we go back to Hagar when she first ran away from Sarah when she was pregnant. And the, this is the well that is named uh, by uh, Hagar as he sees me. And he sees me is referring to Hagar is saying that Yahweh saw her. And she was instructed to go back to Sarah and submit to Sarah's authority. And this occurs in Genesis chapter 16 verse 14. And also we move on to uh, Genesis 25 verses 8 through 11. He took his last breath and died at a ripe old age, old and contented, and he was gathered to his people. His sons Yitzchak and Ishmael buried him in a cave of Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephron, son of Tohar the Hittite. This was the field that Avram bought from the Hittites. Avram was buried there with his wife Sarah. After Avram's death, Elohim blessed his son Yitzchak, who lived near Be'er Lachai Roe. Uh, these verses point at the possibility that Avram and Yitzchak had a close relationship with Yishmael. This it seemed to be the adversarial relationship that we have been so frequently led to believe. Yishmael was not cursed. His uh, descendants, along with Esau's descendants, do tend to do some things that aren't good for Yisrael. But in uh, throwing, you know, keeping coals on uh, Yishmael and Esau's descendants, uh, it's kind of like uh, the 12 tribes, uh, the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, Israel has its own problems, and that's why we're where we're at now. Uh, in Genesis 25.4, which is where we begin this week's teaching, uh, it says, And Midian's sons were Epha, Epher, Hanok, Abida, and Elda'ah, these were the sons of Keturah. Now, Midian is the son. The others are the sons of Midian. But Abraham, this is his marriage after Sarah dies. Now, some of the Jews believe that this is Hagar, but Hagar would be quite a uh, healthy age herself at this point, probably beyond her childbearing years. So it's probably not likely that Keturah and Hagar are the same woman. But, Abraham had a total of eight sons. Midian is one of his last six. Uh, we are introduced to Midian, another of Abraham's sons, who is the ancestor of Yitro and Zipporah, Moshe's father-in-law, and his wife. So, as Abraham is instructed in Genesis 17, verses 10 through 14, all his male descendants and servants are to be circumcised or must be sent out from his household. Then Yitro is, Yitro is also required to be circumcised. So what exactly is happening in Exodus chapter 4? This incident is occurring as Moshe is heading back to the land after Yahweh sends him back, telling him, go get the children of Israel. On that trip, at an overnight campsite, it happened that Yahweh confronted him and sought to put him to death. So Zipporah took a knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and threw it at Moshe's feet. Then she said, You are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time she said, You are a bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. The interesting thing here is the commentators, uh, no one sure, because even in the Hebrew, it's somewhat vague as to who Yahweh was going to kill and who was the one that was not circumcised. Most believe it was Moshe was the one that Yahweh was going to kill, and it was one of his sons that was not circumcised. But that does not seem to fit the instructions of the circumcision. So, those are interesting little tidbits. The requirements from the day Abraham was circumcised are that from that day forward, the eighth day is the day of circumcision. No exceptions. Abraham was to send out any of his own descendants. 
that are male or any of his male servants that would not submit to circumcision from that day forward. Circumcision is a covenant related to the promise. Circumcision itself is not a covenant in the same sense as some of the other covenants. It is a sign of faith that you expect the promise to be fulfilled. It is a sign saying, I'm laying claim to the promise that Yah promised our father Abraham and his descendants. Circumcision allows us to live in the land. None of Abraham's descendants are allowed to live in any of the promised land, which is way bigger than just Israel. At least three times between the Torah and the Tanakh, the 12 tribes are told what the borders of the 12 tribes of Israel are. They in no way cover all the area where Abraham set his foot. So, those who believe that Ishmael and Asab and other of Abraham's descendants get nothing are badly mistaken. What exactly they get, I can't tell you for sure. But they're not left out in the cold. They are going to get their promise because of Yitzchak, who is the son of the promise. Yitzchak is the conduit of how the promise is going to be fulfilled. Yitzchak is the son of the promise, not the promise. The promise is the land. So Yitzchak had to be alive to bear sons, or Yah is a liar. This is why Abraham had to believe in resurrection, and that would be, have to be why he was willing to, if he had to, kill Yitzchak. Because Yitzchak is the son that Abraham's going to have to prove Yahweh's promise that his descendants would inherit a land. Heirs according to the promise. Those of you who are Christians who are laying claim to being heirs according to the promise, the promise is not to go to heaven. It's a land in a physical place on the planet Earth. Hebrews 8, I mean Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went out to a place he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents with Yitzchak and Yaakov, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is Elohim. A physical place and a physical city. What's a city? A city isn't buildings. A city is people. Who was the architect of creation? And what did he say his crowning point of creation was? Was humanity. Because humanity was going to be assigned the duty of being the caretaker for all the rest of creation. Interestingly, Nahor and Yishmael each produced 12 sons, just like Yaakov did. You will find that in Genesis 22, verses 20 to 24, relating to Nahor, and uh, 25, uh, verses 13 to 15, which describes Yishmael's descendants. Uh, it's interesting, there's 12. Uh, you will not find the number 10, like so many people think, uh, related to virtually anything except the ten tribes. So I sus suspect and I suggest to you that in Revelation is it possible that the ten kings may be representative of the ten tribes. Now that is just my speculation and a hypothesis and I've held that for quite some time. Uh, Israel's greatest enemy is Israel. I don't care which tribe you are. Faith or trust is what Abraham displayed when Yah considered him righteous. So what did he do to show that he believed Yah concerning Yitzchak's promised birth? What did Abraham do to show that he had faith? 
he and Sarah had sexual relations. And that's how he showed he had faith. Yah doesn't perform magic. He can do anything, but he doesn't perform magic. He said to Abraham that the son of the promise would come from Abraham's loins and Sarah's womb. That's why Yishmael is not the son of the promise, even though he is Abraham's son, but he is not Sarah's son. He and Sarah had sexual relations, plain and simple. No question. That's how he showed his faith. It's just like when he showed his faith, when uh, Yah said, like, uh, your descendants will be like the stars in the sky. And it says that Abraham went out, and what did he do when he went out? Uh, he looked at the stars. Okay, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 to 39, it says... I need to turn back one. I turned too many pages there. Sorry about that. For if we deliberately sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. Now, uh, I don't know in this particular case because I did not look it up, and, uh, but in most cases the word adversary is the Hebrew word satan. If anyone regards Moshe's law, disregards Moshe's law, he dies without mercy based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Two or three witnesses. Remember that. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the son of Elohim, regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and insulted the spirit of grace? For we know the one who has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. And again, Yahweh will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. Remember the earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions, and at other times you were companions of those who were treated that way. For you sympathized with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confiscation of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. So don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you need endurance, so that after you have done Elohim's will, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while the coming one will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and obtained life. Uh, in some of the translations, uh, this in verse 37 would be, and the just shall live by their faith. This is a quote from Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by their faith. What are the consequences of reneging on our end of the covenant or testament with Yeshua? Now those of you who do not understand and have not seen my previous video where I addressed this issue, the word covenant and testament both come from the same Greek word, the Attica. There is not a covenant and a testament. They are the same thing. The bread and wine are not some ritual to simply partake of, but an agreement to the renewed covenant of Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 37, as Yeshua points out in Matthew 26, verses 26 to 30, Mark 14, verses 22 to 25, Luke 22, verses 14 to 20. And Shaul tells us how important understanding this participation is, and not to regard it lightly, in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 32. If you partake of the bread and the wine in this manner, you are agreeing to blessing or cursing. You're going to get one or the other. By drinking the cup and eating the bread, you're agreeing that you're entitled to whatever you deserve. And we're going to go back and touch on Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 37. Look, the days are coming. This is Yahweh's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah... 
This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke even though I had married them, Yahweh's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, Yahweh's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their Elohim and they will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them. This is Yahweh's declaration. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. This is what Yahweh says, The one who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea and makes its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from my presence, this is Yahweh's declaration, then also Israel's descendants will cease to be a nation before me forever. This is what Yahweh says, If the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below explored, I will reject all of Israel's descendants because of all they have done. This is Yahweh's declaration. This is the biggest attack that the scriptures launch against replacement theology. This is not a covenant with the Gentiles. This is a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The problem is people do not understand what a Gentile is. A Gentile merely means the nations. Oh, there's a covenant with the other nations, but it's not the same one as with Israel. And if you're not familiar with the fact that there's more than one covenant, maybe you need to study scripture more. Get back to the Torah. Also, those who believe that uh, he's going to destroy the heavens and the earth, and then he's going to make a new one. He said, if anything ever happens to heaven and earth, his word's a lie. Yah says that himself. Oh, and guess who the word is that Jeremiah heard here? The word is a manifestation of the entity we know as Yeshua. Isn't it very interesting that the next time we come across this, Yeshua is speaking of this same covenant himself when he's with his disciples on that night before he dies. I'm going to read the version from Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of Elohim. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of Elohim comes. Then he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them, and said, This is my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. It is the second cup that is the cup of the covenant. He said, Of the renewed covenant. This is the blood symbol. All covenants require blood. In this instance, the wine is representing the blood. As I said, a lot of trouble comes to people because they drink this cup not understanding what they're doing when they drink the cup. In 1 Corinthians 11, Shaul gives us some very important warnings. And many of you, probably, in especially some of the Protestant denominations, are familiar with parts of this passage because many times they're used during the service offering communion. You need to pay attention to what you're doing when you drink that cup, eat that bread, because this, this is not just some routine you're going through. For I received from the Master what I also passed on to you. 
On the night when he was betrayed, Master Yeshua took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new or renewed covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Master's death until he comes. This is not about resurrection. This is about acknowledging the sacrifice that Yeshua makes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Master in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Master. And the Master referring to here is Yeshua. So a man should examine himself in this way. He should eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly evaluating ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Master, so that we may not be condemned with the world. It says Yeshua is judging us for not drinking this cup, understanding what he did. He did not die so that we did not have to obey. He died so that we could have access to forgiveness. So that we could have access to return or come in for the first time to a covenant. If you drink the cup of the renewed covenant, you're saying, I agree to the rules that Israel has to live under. Remember, Shaul said there's one olive tree. And it gets its nourishment from the root. The branches do not feed the tree. The branches are fed by the root. And who's the root of that tree? It is Yahweh and Yeshua. So if you are denying access, that you are part of the same tree that Israel's part of, then you're immediately disqualifying yourself and saying, I'm not part of the covenant. I'm not in the same covenant. I'm in the New Testament. No, you're not. If this passage that Shaul's talking about is read to you, you're in a lot of trouble, my friends, if you then think you can turn around and say, I can live however I want. I have no responsibilities. I've got grace. Remember, it says, he shows grace or favor to the humble, not to the willfully disobedient or the arrogant. If you partake of the bread and the wine in this manner, you are agreeing to blessing or cursing. Which one you're entitled to is the one you get. Remember, Yeshua said, whatsoever we sow, we will reap. We're going to reap a harvest. If we sow tares, we're not going to reap wheat. And vice versa. This is not a pick what we like and discard the rest manner. And now I'm going to read a long section here from our brother Shaul from his letter to the Romans. Beginning at verse, I mean chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with Elohim through our master, Yeshua HaMashiach. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of Elohim. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions, because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because Elohim's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless at the appointed moment, Mashiach died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But Elohim proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners... Mashiach died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to Elohim through the death of his son, 
then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in Elohim through our master, Yeshua HaMashiach. We have now received this reconciliation through him. Therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all men because all sinned. In fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is a prototype of the coming one. But the gift is not like the trespass, for, it, but for if by one man's trespass the many died, how much more have the grace of Elohim and the gift overflowed to the many by the grace of the one man, Yeshua HaMashiach. And the gift is not like the one man's sin, because from one sin came the judgment, resulting in condemnation, but from many trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. Since by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Yeshua HaMashiach? So then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act there is a life-giving justification for everyone. For just as though one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The law came along to multiply the trespass, but where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Yeshua HaMashiach, our Master. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Messiah, Yeshua, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Mashiach was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too may we walk in a new way of life. For if we've been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is freed from sin's claims. Now if we died with Mashiach, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Mashiach, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him, for in the light of the fact that he died, he died through sin once and for all. But in light of the fact that he lives, he lives to Elohim. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Elohim and Mashiach, Yeshua. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to Elohim and all the parts of yourselves to Elohim as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. And I want to address this issue. This is what Yeshua is talking about when he says, take my yoke upon you. We're wearing one yoke or the other. We're either obeying because of Yeshua or we continue to sin and disobey. We can't have it both ways. Grace doesn't allow us to just sin and not have it counted against us. But thank Elohim that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching you were transferred to. And having been liberated from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. Okay, what is the teaching that you've been transferred to? The Torah. I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to moral impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness... So now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, 
You were free from allegiance to righteousness. Oh, you were free from allegiance to righteousness. You couldn't be righteous when you were a slave to sin, nor I. When we're slaves to sin, we're not righteous. So what fruit was produced then from the things that you are now ashamed of? Oh, are you ashamed? If you realize you still do something that he says not to do, have you stopped doing it? For the end of those things is death. But now since you have been liberated from sin and become enslaved to Elohim, you have your fruit which results in sanctification and the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Elohim is eternal life in Mashiach Yeshua our Master. Since I am speaking to those who understand law, brothers, are you unaware that the law has authority over someone as long as he lives? For example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding the husband. If you don't understand what Yeshua did, you don't have a clue what that verse was just telling us. So then if she gives herself to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. Then if she gives herself to another man, she is not an adulteress. Therefore, my brothers, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the crucifixion body of the Mashiach, so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we may bear fruit for Elohim. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions operated through the law in every part of us and bore fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to the, what held us so that we may serve the new way of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. This is one of the biggest stumbling blocks for Christianity. The letter of the law does not allow me to have any mercy. If two or, th or more witnesses say they saw me commit a sin that is unto death, the judges and the priest had to make sure that death sentence is carried out. What should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. The law is not sin. The law is not what causes us to sin, but sin takes advantage of the law and causes us to not want to adhere to the law. On the contrary, I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would have not known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. Therefore, did what is good cause my death? Absolutely not. On the contrary... Sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am made out of flesh, sold into sin's power. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but it is the sin that lives in me. I'm not doing it, but it's still me that's sinning. So I discover this principle, when I want to do what is good, evil is with me. For in my inner self, I joyfully agree with Elohim's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this dying body. I thank Elohim through Yeshua HaMashiach, our Master. 
So then with my mind, I myself am a slave to the law of Elohim, but with my flesh to the law of sin. I can think one thing, and yet still let the lust in me cause me to do what is wrong. I and my body are not two different things. Excuse me there, get a little dry. No. So, if we take the bread and the wine, and we think that all I have to do is say a little prayer, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and that's the end of the story. I think our brother Shaw Wool is constantly telling us we're supposed to uh, live the way Messiah lived. I am not an immortal soul, so blaming my body for my sin is a ridiculous concept. Our brother Shaul is not blaming his body for his sin. He's saying that because sin was invited into the world by the first human being, it has been dwelling among us all this time, and we keep grabbing a hold of it and inviting it into us. Don't pat ourselves on the back. That's what Moshe warned Israel. The day will come when you will say, my sin doesn't count. Life is in the blood, so therefore when we die, we do not live in some mystical mumbo-jumbo place. As without breath, we are just dust. Oh, Genesis 2, 7, 3, 19, 18, 28. These are all places in the Torah where Adam is reminded by Yahweh, and then later Abraham himself admits, Abba, I'm dust. This idea that Abraham and Adam thought they had an immortal soul, what would the threat of, for the day you eat of it, you will surely die if there was a part of me that was immortal? No such thing. Resurrection is the promise, not going to heaven. Acts 24, 15, and 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 28, and Philippians 3, 7 to 11. What is Shaul referring to when he speaks of righteousness of the law. What's the righteousness of the law? It has to do with faith. It does not mean there's no mercy. The law itself can't save me because the law is just the context. If your parents tell you when you're growing up, you do this, and then you can expect this. Or if you do this, then you can expect the opposite, which is punishment or reward. If they uh, allow you to do what they told you not to do, and they give you a reward, isn't that deception? Will you ever believe their word if you think you can manipulate them and get away with it? That's not a parent who wants their child to grow up understanding the benefits of doing right want to teach them right and then carry out that example themselves plainly he cannot be saying that the Torah is worthless or sin as that would make all his letters godly good since he says the wages of sin is death oh he clearly said that in the section in Romans there I just read the wages of sin is death John informs us that sin is transgression of the law, Torah. So scripturally speaking, if we do not know, uh, if we do know the right and do the wrong, we are sinning. How can Christians go around telling people they are sinners, yet refuse to use the New Testament's definition for sin? That is nothing but hypocrisy, and no wonder their message is rejected as crap by the world. It is two-faced, as defining sin is something they don't want to do, as it would force them to address those things in their own lives. I know this, because that's where I was. I'm confessing that's the way I used to be. I'm trying to be different. 
I'm trying to walk a different way. I'm trying to walk the way of my Mashiach. He's, you know, we can choose to believe whatever we want, but that doesn't make it so. Justified by faith according to the Bible means to do Yah's will, trusting him to keep his word to us based on the statement he makes that he is not a man that he can lie. And he makes that statement to Moshe in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. He's not a man that he can lie. Also correlates to the verse in Hebrews where it says that Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeshua comes proclaiming a kingdom which is a government that has rules for its members. <clears throat> Excuse me here. Like I said, it's getting a little dry today. We had a few technical problems earlier and had to begin retaping three times. Uh, thank you all that we're finally getting this one taped. But uh, Yeshua, Yahoo proclaimed, who has believed our report? And unfortunately, most who claim to follow Jesus don't believe that report. They mock Elohim by declaring a covenant of their own design, not Yah's. The sad part is they don't know that most of them are descendants of Yaakov, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. If you don't know that, you need to read Jeremiah 16, 14 to 18, Genesis 35, 11, and Genesis 48, 14, and 16. For in Genesis 35, 11, Yah tells Yaakov his descendants will become Gentiles. That means they will fall away from the covenant. Jeremiah 16, 14 to 18 is talking about the return of the ten tribes. It's not talking about the Jews. The Jews fall under a different category of how he's dealing with them. They didn't lose their identity. They didn't get exiled for all these centuries. And in Genesis 48, 14 to 16, is where ya Yaakov is blessing his grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And most of you will not see this in your translation but there is a word that's left out, untranslated in most English translations, and the word is dagu. The actual translation should read something like, and may your descendants multiply like fish in the land. Most of the translations, though they are not wrong, they only give the idea of multiplying. They do not understand that in Genesis 48.16 is alluding to what Jeremiah 16.16 16 says when he says, I will send fishermen after you. It is why Yeshua says to the disciples, come and I will make you fishers of men. The fish is one of the symbols of Ephraim and Manasseh, who are the two main faces of the ten tribes in exile. They continue to walk in the ways of Jeroboam, Jeroboam and prefer to kiss the calf instead of their husband. You like kissing a cow? I know you guys out there, you know, you probably not, this is probably not dawning on you, but you know what? We're part of the bride too. Would you want to go out in the nearest pasture and kiss the nearest calf? Would you want to go up to even a statue of a calf and kiss it? How empty of a response that would be? That's what Yerobam introduced into the northern kingdom. He made two golden calves, just like they had made in the wilderness. He put one in Beit El, Beth El, and the other in the city of Dan, which was in the very northern part of the territory that Israel had at that time. So that they wouldn't go to the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month on the 15th day through the 22nd and that they would go on the 15th day of the 8th month to his shrines. Yeshua asked Kepha if Kepha loved him and three times it was asked and each time Kepha said yes and Yeshua replied then feed my lambs or feed my sheep. 
This, uh, this particular instance occurs in John 21, verses 15 through 17. Feed my sheep. He's talking about the ten tribes. That's why he made the statement to the woman that when the demon cast out of her daughter, uh, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It doesn't mean he did, he's not doing anything for the Jews or anybody else on the planet. But he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel so that they could be remarried. Yah said he divorced the northern kingdom. He did not divorce the Jews. Shaul tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Elohim. So if Yeshua is the word made flesh and that word is the Torah, then if we don't hear Moshe read on Shabbat, then whose words are we hearing? Who is Satan? Are you? Did El say? And I'm going to close for this week. May Yah bless you and keep you. May He keep His hand upon you. May His face shine on you. And may He give you shalom. And until next time, shalom alakum.